So we decided to do a fairy tale this week, and this is one known as The Man Who Did Not Wish to Die. So is this a story you've heard of before, Heather? Do you know, I have not heard this story before. This is another one from our old fairy tale book, the one by Ye, Theodora Ozaki. Someone we still want to give our own episode to at some point, but I think it's an interesting story, and I hope you kind of... I hope you like it. Alright, so here's the tale, The Old Man Who Did Not Wish to Die. Long, long ago, there lived a man called Sentaro. His surname meant millionaire, but although he was not so rich as all that, he was still far very removed from being poor. He had inherited a small fortune from his father, and lived on this, spending his time carelessly, without any serious thoughts of work, till he was about 32 years of age. One day, without any reason whatsoever, the thought of death and sickness came to him. The idea of falling ill or dying made him very wretched. I should like to live, he said to himself, till I am five or six hundred years old at least, free from all sickness. The ordinary span of a man's life is very short. He wondered whether it were possible, by living simply and frugally henceforth, to prolong his life as long as he wished. He knew there were many stories in ancient history of emperors who had lived a thousand years, and there was a princess of Yamato who, it was said, lived to the age of five hundred. This was the latest story of a very long life record. Sentaro had often heard the tale of the Chinese king named Shin no Shiko. He was one of the most famous and able and powerful rulers in Chinese history. He built all the large palaces and also the famous Great Wall of China. He had everything in the world he could wish for. But in spite of all his happiness and the luxury and the splendor of his court, the wisdom of his counselors and the glory of his reign, he was miserable because he knew that one day he must die and leave it all. When Shin no Shiko went to bed at night, when he rose in the morning, as he went through his day, the thought of death was always with him. He could not get away from it. Ah, if only he could find the elixir of life, he would be happy. The emperor at last called a meeting to his courtiers and asked them all if they could not find for him the elixir of life, of which he had so often read and heard. One old courtier, Jofuku by name, said that far away across the seas there was a country called Horizon, and that certain hermits lived there who possessed the secrets of the elixir of life. Whoever drank from its wonderful draught lived forever. The emperor ordered Jofuku to set out for the land of Horizon, to find the hermits and to bring him back a file of magical elixir. He gave Jofuku one of his best junks, fitted it out for him, and loaded it with great quantities of treasure and precious stones for Jofuku to take as presents to the hermits. Jofuku sailed for the land of Horizon, but he never returned to the waiting emperor. But ever since that time, Mount Fuji has been said to be the fabled horizon and the home of hermits who had the secret of the elixir, and Jofuku has been worshipped as their patron god. Now Sentaro determined to set out to find the hermit, and if he could to become one, so that he might obtain the water of perpetual life. He remembered that as a child he had been told that not only did these hermits live on Mount Fuji, but they, they were said to inhabit all the very high peaks. So he left his home to the care of his relatives and started out on his quest. He travelled through all the mountainous regions of the land, climbing to the tops of the highest peaks, but never a hermit did he find. At last, after wandering in an unknown region for many days, he met a hunter. Can you tell me, asked Sentaro, where the hermits live who have the elixir of life? No, said the hunter. I can't tell you where such hermits live, but there is a notorious robber living in these parts. It is said that he is a chief of a band of 200 followers. This odd answer irritated Santaro very much, and he thought how foolish it was to waste more time in looking for the hermits in this way. So he decided to go at once to the shrine of Jofuku, who is worshipped as the patron god of the hermits in the south of Japan. Santaro reached the shrine and prayed for seven days, entreating Jofuku to show him the way to a hermit who could give him what he wanted so much to find. At midnight on the seventh day, as Santaro knelt in the temple, the door of the innermost shrine flew open, and Jofuku appeared in a luminous cloud, and calling to Santaro to come nearer, spoke thus, Your desire is a very selfish one and cannot be easily granted. 
You think that you would like to become a hermit so as to find the elixir of life. Do you know how hard a hermit's life is? A hermit is not allowed to eat fruit and berries and the bark of pine trees. A hermit must cut himself off from the world so that his heart may become as pure as gold and free from every earthly desire. Gradually, after following these strict rules, the hermit ceases to feel hunger or cold or heat, and his body becomes so light that he can ride on a crane or a carp and can walk on water without getting his feet wet. You, Santoro, are fond of good living and of every comfort. You are not even like an ordinary man, for you are exceptionally idle and more sensitive to heat and cold than most people. You would never be able to go barefoot or to wear only one thin dress in the winter time. Do you think that you would ever have the patience or the endurance to live a hermit's life? In answer to your prayer, however, I will help you in another way. I will send you to the country of perpetual life, where death never comes, where the people live forever. Saying this, Jofuku put into Sentaro's hand a little crane made of paper, telling him to sit on its back and it would carry him there. Sentaro obeyed wonderingly. The crane grew large enough for him to ride on it with comfort. It then spread its wings, rose high in the air, and flew away over the mountains right out to sea. Sentaro was at first quite frightened, but by degrees he grew accustomed to the swift flight through the air. On and on they went for thousands of miles. The bird never stopped for rest or food. But as it was pa a paper bird, it doubtless did not require any nourishment. And strange to say, neither did Sentaro. After several days they reached an island. The crane flew some distance inland and then alighted. As soon as Sentaro got down from the bird's back, the crane folded up on its own accord and flew into his pocket. Now Sentaro began to look around him wonderingly, curious to see what the country of perpetual life was like. He walked first around the country and then through the town. Everything was, of course, quite strange and different from his own land. But both the land and the people seemed prosperous, so he decided that it would be good for him to play there and to stay there, and took up lodgings at once in one of the hotels. The proprietor was a kind man, and when Santaro told him that he was a stranger had come to live there, he promised to arrange everything that was necessary with the governor of the city concerning Santaro's sojourn there. He even found a house for his guest, and in this way Santaro obtained his great wish and became a resident in the country of perpetual life. Within the memory of all the islanders, no man had ever died there, and sickness was a thing unknown. Priests had come over from India and China and told them of a beautiful country called Paradise where happiness and bliss and contentment filled all men's hearts, but its gates could only be reached by dying. This tradition was handed down for ages from generation to generation, but none knew exactly what death was except that it led to paradise. Quite unlike Santaro and other ordinary people, instead of having a great dread of death, they all, both rich and poor, longed for it as something good and desirable. They were all tired of their long, long lives, and longed to go to the happy land of contentment called Paradise, of which the priests had told them centuries ago. All this Sentaro soon found out by talking to the islanders. He found himself, according to their ideas, in the land of topsy-turvydom. Everything was upside down. He had wished to escape from dying. He had come to the land of perpetual life with great relief and joy, only to find out that the inhabitants themselves doomed never to die were considerate bliss to find death. What he had hitherto considered poison, these people ate as good food, and all the things to which they had been accustomed to as food they rejected. Whenever any merchants from other countries arrived, the rich people rushed to them eager to buy poison. These they swallowed eagerly, hoping for death to come so that they might go to paradise. But what were deadly poisons in other lands were without effect in this strange place, and people who swallowed them with the hope of dying only found that in a short time they felt in better health instead of worse. Vainly they tried to imagine what death could be like. The wealthy would have given all their money and all their goods if they could, but shortened their lives to two or three hundred years even. Without any change to live on forever seemed to this people wearisome and sad. In the chemist shops there was a drug which was in constant demand, because after using it for a hundred years it was supposed to turn the hair slightly grey and to bring about disorders of the stomach. Sentaro was astonished to find out that the poisonous globefish was served up in restaurants as a delicate dish, and hawkers in the street went about selling sauces made of Spanish flies. He never saw anyone ill after eating those horrible things, nor did he ever see anyone with as much as a cold. 
Sentaro was delighted. He said to himself that he would never grow tired of living, and that he considered it profane to wish for death. He was the only happy man on this island. For his part, he wished to live thousands of years and to enjoy life. He set himself up in business, and for the present, never even dreamed of going back to his native land. As years went by, however, things did not go as smoothly as the first. He had heavy losses in business, and several times some affairs went wrong with his neighbours. This caused him great annoyance. Time passed like the flight of an arrow for him, for he was busy from morning till night. Three hundred years went by in this monotonous way, and then at last he began to grow tired of life in this country, and he longed to see his own land and his old home. However long he lived here, life would always be the game. So was it not foolish and wearisome to stay on here forever? Sentaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recollected Jofuku, who had helped him before when he was wishing to escape from death, and he prayed to the saint to bring him back to his own land again. No sooner did he pray than the paper crane popped out of his pocket. Sentaro was amazed to see that it had remained undamaged after all these years. Once more the bird grew and grew till it was large enough for him to mount it. As he did so, the bird spread its wings and flew swiftly out across the ocean in the direction of Japan. Such was the willfulness of the man's nature that he looked back and regretted all he had left behind. He tried to stop the bird in vain. The crane held on its way for thousands of miles across the ocean. Then a storm came on, and the wonderful paper crane got damp, crumpled up, and fell into the sea. Sentaro fell with it. Very much frightened at the thought of being drowned, he cried out loudly for Jofuku to save him. He looked around, but there was no ship in sight. He swallowed a quantity of seawater, which only increased his miserable plight. While he was thus struggling to keep himself afloat, he saw a monstrous shark swimming towards him. As it came nearer, it opened its huge mouth, ready to devour him. Sentara was all but paralyzed with fear now that he felt his end so near, and screamed out as loudly as ever he could to Jifuku to come and rescue him. Lo and behold, Sentara was awakened by his own screams, to find that during his long prayer he had fallen asleep before the shrine and that all his extraordinary and frightful adventures had only been a wild dream. He was in a cold perspiration with fright and utterly bewildered. Suddenly a bright light came towards him, and in the light stood a messenger. The messenger held a book in his hand and spoke to Sentaro. I am sent to you by Jofuku, who in answer to your prayer has permitted you in a dream to see the land of perpetual life. But you grew weary of living there, and begged to be allowed to return to your native land so that you might die. Jofuku, so that he might try you, allowed you to drop into the sea, and then sent a shark to swallow you up. Your desire for death was not real, for even at that moment you cried out loudly and shouted for help. It is also vain for you to wish to become a hermit, or to find the elixir of life. These things are not for such as you. Your life is not austere enough. It is best for you to go back to your paternal home and live a good and industrious life. Never neglect keep the anniversaries of your ancestors and make it your duty to provide for your children's future. Thus you will live to a good old age and be happy, but give up the vain desires to escape death, for no man can do that. And by this time you have surely found out that even when selfish desires are granted, they do not bring happiness. In this book I give you there are many precepts good for you to know. If you study them, you will be guided in the way I have pointed out to you. The angel disappeared as soon as he had finished speaking, and Sentaro took the lesson to heart. With a book in his hand, he returned to his old house, and giving up all his old vain wishes, tried to live a good and useful life, and to observe the lessons taught to him in the book, and he and his house prospered henceforth. Uh, so what did you think of the story? I really enjoyed that story. It feels more unusual for us to have a story that has like a positive happy ending and this one this one does so it's it's nice i i like stories with happy endings i think you were kind of right when you mentioned the moral i don't know if, if that bit will make it in after my editing but you said like it's interesting to also have a story sometimes where we have a moral um because this one kind of does which hmm. is like appreciate and enjoy the life you have hmm. yeah um and, like, don't be afraid of death, because maybe if you're going to live forever, it takes a certain meaning out of life, because 
there is no time limit for you to make your achievements or to find happiness or to make a family and stuff like that. So, but I found it so interesting that the people were like they went to that place because they were told it was paradise where they could live forever. And then after finding out that if they died, they could find a better paradise, they immediately wanted to die. Like they were eating and drinking poisons every day, which had no effect on them. So, what to them constitutes paradise? Like, is there always a higher level of paradise, and would these people never actually be satisfied because they weren't satisfied with living forever and being able to basically do whatever they want? That's that's true. It's a, it's a good point. I think, you know, we always try to work for something and get something, but sometimes it feels that a lot of the enjoyment is the effort and the achievement to get it. And then once you get what you want... People aren't always happy, or you don't stay happy, or you're looking for that next thing. So they don't have a particular journey anymore. There's For them, there's not much, maybe all the time in the world, so they can accomplish anything. But then again, I feel that they didn't have those plans or actions in mind. Like most people, there's like, this is what I want to achieve, and they achieve it, and then they think, okay, what can I do next? as I continue on in my life, but if your only goal is to achieve the ability to live forever and then you get it, where do you go from there? Because they had no aspirations to fill that endless void, I suppose. I'm also, I wondered during the story, for the people who live forever, are they seeing like modern improvements that are happening there, or is it the same thing mm. the whole entire time? So, you know, no electricity, no, it's no running water or things like that. So just the same day in and day out with no changes. I mean, you would hope that, well, presumably, I mean, when he went there, he, he didn't say like he left Earth. He stayed on the Earth. Mm. He just flew to a distant land. So presumably, you know, technology would still arrive and spread and improve over time. So... But I guess you're right. If you are living forever, but you're living back during those times, there's still a lot of hardships you would have to suffer through every year. But at least you you kind of wouldn't have to eat or drink, perhaps. But you still have to maintain your house. You still need to keep it lit. You still got to keep on top of it because I doubt people would be going to the land of eternal life and then wanting to work as a house cleaner <laughs> well, i mean if you work as a house cleaner your job's never done so you know you have something to keep trying to accomplish they, they would have a purpose but i wouldn't want to live forever and have to clean oh, houses no. for all eternity no. like the whole premise is to be able to relax and do exactly what you want i mean if you enjoy cleaning fair enough that's true but i wouldn't want to do it for all eternity no i don't i also even... found it interesting at the start of the story where they mentioned the elixir of life oh like we had mentioned, we'd heard that before mentioned when we did Mount Fuji. Mm. Yeah. Like many, many stories always talking of the elixir of life being upon the slopes of Mount Fuji. So it was nice to hear that again from a different tale. But I mean, I like the story and it's nice to have a moral. Like we said, I feel that Momotaro and things don't have a moral. Or maybe there is, but it's more of a Japanese moral that doesn't come across well enough. I, I, friendship is... Momotaro, I guess, is the moral? And defeating evil. Yeah, I... I, I maybe... Kibidango. <laughs> Kibidango is the moral of the story. You like, your, enjoy your Kibidango. If you give your friends food, they'll help fight Oni for you. But yeah, I enjoyed the story, and I hope you did too. I did. I liked that one. It's a, it was... That was enjoyable. I mean, all of the oh, stories are enjoyable. I will go ahead and say that as well. Well, now that my our little discussion's over, I guess it's time for Heather's Corner. So, well, I can see the book you've got, so I'll, it looks like it's going to be another Senryu today, which I do like the Senryu. Do, is it anonymous, though? My gosh, I have one with a name. Ooh. But it says Jugoya. So, Jugoya, okay. This is what happens when I randomly pick something and then assume it's anonymous and then it turns out to be not 
but it could be a pen name, so I'm going to look it up right now. So the name is Jugoya, but I'm not finding anything at the current moment. I feel like it's a pen name, which means I'm going to have to do a little bit further research into this one. So I'll, I'll report to you next time on if I can find anything about this particular person. Okay, so I am ready. I am listening. Let's see what I can understand today. I like yatekuru. It's like stop coming. Definitely, you've got kind of. Yeah, you're 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 kind of right on that one. Okay, yuru yuru. I'm not sure the the first the first bit was kaisatsu. Yeah, kaisa kai kaisatsu. Ah, uh, my brain my brain is only hearing aisatsu, so it's it trying to figure out what the actual meaning is. Well, sats. Well, kai always makes me think of by, like the verb, or kai is like shell, or I don't know any other kais in Japanese. Uh, like, joshi kai. So apart from the stop coming part, I'm not too sure about this one today. <laughs> I have not done you well. No, this is, um, yeah, there's words. I'm, I'm looking it up. Um, so kaisatsu is like a ticket gate. Examining t- tickets. So the translation is okay. is uh so like ticky gates these days at train stations are still called kaisatsu. Oh, oh, oh! What a good question. I have another note. Let me just write these notes down because I know I'll forget them. <laughs> but I can ask um, the professor. So the translation I have is the ticket inspector comes to the wicket slowly. Okay. And uh, yuru yuru is onomatopoeia, which is ah uh, okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you can kind of picture yuru yuru sounds like someone going yuru 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 just all the time in the world, and I don't have anywhere mm-hmm. to go or anything to be. So the the explanation for this one is many people are standing in line, and when the appointed hour arrives, the ticket inspector is seen coming in. In an almost insultingly leisurely manner, he shows more clearly than words can express his complete indifference to the traveler's comfort of mind and body, and to whether they ever get on the train or not. I mean, that's quite an in-depth description and interpretation of this scenario. I feel that like that's the longest one we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. I'm picking up on. This has happened to this per- this translator before. This per- this translator is still upset. About like he's that. he's writing that he's writing that from previous experience, yes. whether it was in Japan or somewhere else. But you, yeah, I've definitely seen that before, where you know people are at their job, but they're tired or they've had enough of the day, so everything's just leisurely, and everyone's just like, yeah, I'll get to you when I get to you. But I've never seen that with a ticket man in Japan yet. I don't know about you. Everything's mostly electronics for the tickets now, so... True. The only times I've dealt with a ticket man on a train, it's obviously on ah, the Shinkansen, yeah. they check your tickets. Mm-hmm. Or when, long time ago, when me and Tessa were getting a local train... Ah, yeah, yeah. From my uncle's house to back to Morioka. But the poor guy, like, he kept looking at us, and he was like, should I talk to them? Should I ask him for a ticket? And we were ready to ask for our ticket, but he was like, I'm too scared there. I don't know. Maybe he thought far and they we wouldn't know what to say or how to get our ticket. So we didn't get a ticket on that train. We just got off, and then the woman at the other side was like, "Where's your ticket?" We were like, "The the guy didn't let us buy one." <laughs> he he wasn't. He didn't have a leisurely pace. He was just like, "Oh, I I don't know how to." give tickets to the two foreigners, even though we knew how to get the tickets, but it's fine, it's whatever. It was funny at the time. There's, for some local trains, there's unpersoned gates, and you just buy a paper ticket and you drop it in that, so if you're not an honest person, you probably could just walk on by. I don't know if the the places are recorded or not, so, you know, you were also honest and stopped and said, I don't have a ticket. <laughs> What it was like as well in Morioka, if I got the train from the main station to the station in my house, I think it was like a honesty system sometimes, especially late at night. 
Kind of just put your ticket in the mm. ah, yeah. paper basket as you left. Yeah. Or sometimes on the, the coach that we could get from Kisarazu to Tokyo, you could buy those tickets that you were supposed to add up the numbers to the prepaid amount and put them in the cash thing. But oh my if you just put them in quick enough, you could have been very dishonest and just like, not put enough in because they didn't have time to check you just put them in yeah side note if you come here and do that please please don't do that please please be honest that would be great thank you mm. it's just you know yes please be we honest were, we, we were honest we buy our tickets we put our stuff in promise we did all the right things so <laughs> i don't think i could bring myself to do that i i, I would feel like no <laughs> yeah yeah but i i've not encountered well no I've, I've had sometimes like waiting in line at to get it like a shinkansen ticket like i still go to the person to buy it, you know do it online or call i should i should yeah. do that but i kind of like practicing my japanese so i go into, into line and um like you have one of the ticket gates closed and so you're standing there waiting and they're doing something and the like the lines building up and starting to go out the door and they're just mm -hmm. you know adjusting a seat doing something with i don't even know what because i can't see behind the counter <laughs> oh so something like that's happened before i don't think i've ever had that oh no wait sometimes i have like you get to the front of the queue and then you're just like oh that person's free and then they don't call you over and then you're just waiting and it's like i don't know what you're doing like, I don't think, you don't look like you're, obviously they're doing something, but it's like, they haven't called me yet. That's also, if if I get to that front point, you have to pay attention because, you know, you might not always catch what they're saying. And sometimes they do hand signals and are, you know, say, you know, Gexama and have to see. And so it's, you, you kind of have to stare, it's like, make sure I'm going to catch. And you, you know, you do that. So you're not standing there and they have to kind of get your attention and then it gets awkward. So. You have to watch them. The poor person's like probably more nervous because you're like staring them down. Like, I'm going to pay attention to you. Like, oh, why is she yeah. staring at me? <laughs> why is this foreigner giving me so much attention? It's just making me even more nervous to do my job. <laughs> but I'm trying to make sure that I listen to you okay and I respect you. <laughs> Especially ordering Shinkansen tickets. You gotta really listen and be specific with the days and the times you're saying, and then they'll repeat it all back to you, and you have to make sure you're listening. And even then, after that, bless them, they're really nice. And they will show you all the tickets and check all the dates mm -hmm. and the times mm -hmm. and where you're going. So, I mean, it's a very easy system, even in Japanese. Like, as long as you know days, numbers, time, it's fine. It really is. And, and you can get ways to find out which dates and times that you want to take anyway. In worst case scenario, you could just hold a phone up and say this please yeah i would always make sure i've wrote everything down beforehand as well and if if the worst case happens and for some reason they're not understanding me i can just be like these times these days please i know i'm like this has turned into a really nice conversation about buying shinkansen tickets and it just makes me want to life. travel again oh yeah it's like i tell my friends sooner rather than later now right right yeah but that's the scenario for today. Yeah, thank you for the scenario. It was, I mean, different to the others. We never had one about trains. And we, like I said, we definitely never had one that is so analyzed before. <laughs> <laughs> so it was definitely interesting to see how, I guess, how much interpretation you could give to one small poem. I think the random bookmark I put in this book as I was cleaning the other day. I was talking to you on the phone and I was, oh, I found this bookmark and I put it in the book. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's when that happened. That's when that mm. happened. <laughs> thank you, random bookmark moment. Well, thank you for the senior today. I enjoyed it, and I'm glad you enjoyed the story as well. That is everything from us this week. That's everything for me. How about you, Heather? That's all for me. Okay, everyone. Matane. Minasan, kiyotsukete. Matane.